And we're back. We're back. We said we were going to be right back. We took a half day. We took a day. <laughs> we took 24 <laughs> hours. Uh, turns out it was a it was a tougher problem to fix than I thought. Fucking tech stuff, dude. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you did it. You did it well, though. I think we it could have been more of a catastrophe. And this is, you know, it's all tri trial and error. It's all right. I've been trying so long to get, you know, the 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 video portion of this podcast going. We got it going. I have to forgive myself. <laughs> That's right. This is thematic. Yeah, I have to forgive <laughs> the universe for giving me a shoddy a HDMI cable. I have to forgive Apple. Forgive Apple. I have to. You don't they want to. I don't want to. They don't deserve my forgiveness, no. but I deserve to forgive Apple. I deserve to not live with the resentment. Remember when of... Trump called him Tim Apple? <laughs> <laughs> he did. And everybody around went, just let it go. <laughs> Tim Apple. Tim Apple was like, that's like calling somebody Fred Macaroni. That's just like two words. I mean, yeah, like he's one of the, I mean, he's, he's like the quietest of the Billy billionaires. This is know? my, Mrs. Fields. This is my friend, Debbie cookie. You'd be forgiven Great. for forgetting what Tim cook's name is. Like yeah, I, cook is pretty basic. I, I just had to think as I was saying that, like, is that right? Is Tim cook correct? <laughs> um, but yeah, Apple, for some reason, put two USB C ports on their new lap. Uh, macbooks and regularly you need more than two and they have the space for three or four sure. and that's all they have they don't have like they used to have like all the different ports they would have like hdmi usb like uh the uh, ethernet like they had all these different ports now they have two USB C ports that's it on the entire thing and i'm like give me three yeah why did i don't know yeah and so i i had to go and buy this piece that's a splitter that splits into two USB C ports so now you have three yeah. and it was hard to find <laughs> i had to go to three different best buys to get it he went to fries he went to best buy he went to i didn't go to any fries target i didn't go to fries i did go to a target and they didn't have it there. i had a stepdad that loved the fries and he was like he always said that, that was like a cool outing and i was like not really it's cords yeah fries makes a, a big it's cords <laughs> <laughs> fries makes a big appearance in uh nope yeah which is cool because it is like designed really cool, but also when you're a preteen that hates his stepdad and he's like, "Hey, you want to go over there and go check out some bleep 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 bleep?" And you're like, "It's just cords, bro. It's cords. It's this aisles and aisles of cords. So many cords. Yeah, yeah. We don't need that." Um, but I got it. We got it sorted. The next thing, the fine. There's here's. I I did an episode like a year and a half ago called Gear with my friend David Rosenblatt, where we just talked about like the accumulation of gear. How oh. when you're making music or when you're making content from home, you're, it and and like the process of getting more and more gear, and it really is a never ending process. At, with every new piece I get, there's always some other little piece that I haven't gotten that's been left off the list that needs to be found. And it's just, it, it never ends. There's always more gear to get. And so even just this little splitter, I didn't think I needed because I had the HDMI cord going into the <laughs> fucking, uh, uh, the, 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 the capture card that I had. And then that shitted out. So I had to use the, it's a whole thing, whole thing. you know, and, and, and now there's the final thing that oh, I keep saying the final thing, it's never going to be the final <laughs> thing that I think I need to get is I need to figure out how to light how to have that blanket fort sign on while also lighting you well. Cause like we showed look, off, we showed looked off. at this, we looked at this on yesterday's episode too. Yeah. Like it's not bad. It's not bad. It's not bad. It's just that your face gets a lot darker when it's on. And maybe we'll watch this on YouTube later and I'll be like, no, really it doesn't. Like maybe it's just that like the difference between that and that is significant. Okay. It doesn't feel like it, but I can't from what it. I'm looking sure. at, I'm going to figure it out. That's so that's one of the last pieces I say, <laughs> but once I figure that out, there'll be something else where it's like, but if you really want to be professional about it, yeah. you need this piece of gear and whatever. We're back with we're part back. two and we're, back. We're, we're making it work. Um, Here we go. Yeah. Should we? Let's do this now. Uh, hazy boys. Hazy boys. Little, little hazy. 
Hold on. I, last, last time I got to be sh shown popping my thing, you pop it this time. Okay. So slick. Mm -hmm. No. Cheers. Cheers, brother. Right. I like it. Traditions. Yeah. Um, this is a tasty one. It's hazy. Yeah. Hazy for your pledge. I do need, I feel like I need to reiterate for anyone in my audience that's confused. They are fake beers. It's a thing I've been doing lately. I, ha I had a big reservation about fake beer for a long time. I was mm -hmm. like, nah, that's going to fuck me up because it tastes too close to the real thing. And then I'm just going to want a real beer. And I was hanging out with another sober guy like six months ago and he busted one out. And I was like, what are you doing? I was like, don't do that. And I was like, and he was like, it's fine. It's a, it's not real. And I was like, but don't you then want a beer? And he was like, not really. He's like, this actually kind of like scratches the itch for me. Yeah. And it doesn't, because it doesn't have alcohol in it. I don't need like, I, it doesn't have that chemical uh, response of being like, I need more. Yeah. It's hit. It's doing the thing that it does to my brain that makes me want more. It just scratches the itch of like, I miss that taste that, that like refreshing crisp taste of an it's, IPA. It's good. You ever had fake heroin? Uh, yeah. And so it's good. the same thing. It's, it's like, it's all delicious. I really want is that like, the feel of something going into my veins? The feel of heroin. The feel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're just feelers. It's the process. I yeah. like burning it in the I spoon. like a little bit of needle <laughs> and a little bit of I might die. Mm -hmm. And then we're good. I just need a little pinchy pinch. <laughs> <laughs> I go, th it's the ritual of it <laughs> is what it is. Uh, yeah. Because I, <laughs> <laughs> I actually have talked about this with now that I'm drinking fake beer again. It's like. It does actually help when I go to a bar uh -huh. to not just have tonic water and a lime, especially now, not all bars carry um, fake beer, but like the ones that do, it's nice to participate in the ritual of yeah. like being in that social setting yeah. and getting to order the drink that goes with that social setting. I gave you a tasty one last night. Oh yeah. Cherry Guinness. Little, little Berry Guinness. Berry Guinness. Put some, well, you say yeah. berry, but it's just grenadine in a Guinness and it tastes like a goddamn motherfucking strawberry milkshake which by the way uh guinness zero they're not sponsoring this episode but like my full endorsement as like one of the best fake beers out there on the market guinness zero is it's 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 guinness like it's it's guinness it <laughs> they have it all over ireland too i just got back from ireland and because guinness is such a big part of their culture so many bars had guinness zero Did on really? draft and uh, it was great because it meant that I got to like be in again, participating in like the ritual of being in Ireland. You've got to have a Guinness with your stew and what, you know, like, yeah, you have to. Yeah. I mean, when I lived in London and they're drinking at two and two thirty, it's like you don't get weird about it. You go and you have a pint. It's over a business meeting or whatever. And. You gotta watch it because that's a real slippery slope. But oh, yeah. I know all about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> we're just hanging, man. We're just hanging. We're just hanging. Talking about NAs, you know, blanky fort style. It's real forty. Yeah. <laughs> um. Okay, we were in the middle of something. We were we were on a roll. We were on a roll. Yeah, and we were. We, I think we were saying good stuff. We talked about how um, people people need to be better about learning how to apologize better and be clearer and, you know, not doing conditional apologies and not doing conditional forgiveness. Yeah. Uh, something I wanted to, like, go in deeper on, you were in the midst of, of talking about stuff with relationships and stuff, but – and that kind of goes to where we were at. And I wanted to go in a little bit deeper on this because I think one of the things that makes this difficult for people – and I already think I said this yesterday, but is – is sometimes people have people in their past who they're like, I'm sorry, but that person does not deserve my forgiveness. That person did such egregious wrongs to me or harms to me that like, I'm okay living the rest of my life and be, you know, essentially for lack of a better term, dying mad about that, you know, because like that person doesn't deserve my forgiveness. Yeah. And I like, I, some people hold on to grudges like crazy. Yeah. 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 And I want to say like, I fully understand it. I get that, sometimes they're just, they're somewhat justified. Yeah, that people go through shit that you're like, yeah, you didn't deserve that. That's yeah. not okay what that person did to you. Completely. And it's not about, I don't think that forgiveness is always about, in fact, I don't know if it's ever about saying that what was done was okay. I don't think that that's what's being said. No. And I also think that when it comes to like, that person doesn't deserve my forgiveness, what I wanted to say is like, but you deserve to live in a space 
where you have forgiven that harm and where you have healed from that that harm and moved on from that you deserve that because that has to happen and like look man the, the neither one of us have doctorates or degrees in any of this stuff but what we do have is that i do feel like we've been through the shit and you know i feel comfortable and good about talking about it and that that is a crucial element of it that if you don't have that part where you can apply forgiveness for that and sometimes it's like forgive the act forget the forgive the the incident but you don't have to like love the person and then all of a sudden be homies with them again or try to rekindle something there could be something where it's like i don't really need that person in my life at that velocity or ever again that's okay i can have that boundary but but i'm not going to always like i said last night replay the tape that's like but that one thing they did that thing i know a person that's very she's my mother <laughs> And my mother is a lovely. <laughs> you really danced her. I know uh, a person. Am I going to say it? That she. She'll never. Hear she's this. my mother. We love her. We love her. She's so fun. She's the greatest. She's kind of a. She, she's lived an amazing life. Um, she is at cutthroat. If you cross her, you're done. You're done. And I've seen like her friends, a couple of her friends, do something pretty meaningless, or like she got half information from it, and. She never speaks to him ever again. And I've asked her about that. I was like, why did you? In fact, this just happened with my my aunt. I don't like when people say aunt, by the way. It always makes me feel real weird. What do you think about auntie when people say auntie? Mm -hmm. I mean, not for us, but that's kind of a thing in like the black. It sounds community. like a yawn. Um, auntie. Like, my aunt. <laughs> but I, it I, is more of it's, it's a, thing it's a black, culture thing. Yeah, it's a cultural yeah, yeah, thing. Yeah. Like my auntie, totally yeah. get it. But anyway, uh, my mom hadn't talked to my dad who passed away, uh, sister or, or sister-in-law, sorry, for like 25 years. And I was like, why? And she's like, I don't know. She, she always just didn't feel like she embraced me. And I was like, yo, write an email. <laughs> she wrote an email and it was this huge like rekindling they've had this past week where she's like, do you want me to read it to you? It's a really great email. And I'm like, and I just thought, you know, sometimes people kind of stick in their in their ways, in their corners, and we go about our days, we go about what's comfortable, what's familiar, and what's not going to be that high risk, high reward. And forgiveness is high risk, high reward. Yeah. Because you yeah. may, like I said yesterday, you may not get the response you want. There's a lot of people <clears throat> that I would love to see again. Uh, you know some of these people that yeah. really um, – I felt like had a vendetta, had something against me, was really trying to like drive the knife in. And I'm still like, I would go have coffee with them. And yeah. I would really try to bury the hatchet because that's so much more interesting to me than anger. Well, and I'm not trying to be like a Christ figure here or anything, but it really like anger is not my homie and I don't mess with anger really much. Yeah. And I mean, you mentioned this yesterday also that you have a hard time. You don't like losing people. And I'm mm. the same way. And so, yeah, it's always, it's always been a, a strange thing to me. People who really can hold on to grudges and stay mad. Like I have good relationships with most of my exes. Like we, like we're not just like, okay with each other, but like we actually like each other and like cheer for each other and, and, and are happy for each other when good things happen in, in our lives. And I like it that way. I don't, yeah. I don't like people who have meant a lot to me to all of a sudden to just for, for, you know, in perpetuity be like, and now we just don't like each other. And that's, if I know that there's someone out there that I have bad blood with it, it eats at me and I need to fix it. But there's a lot of people that are like, I'm totally cool staying in that bad blood for sure. I mean, what, one of our, one of our fallouts that you and I had a thing that I said to you is I was like, I got to figure out a way to make this right. Because I've, I've been in a situation where like, I've had a friend die without fixing, without fixing shit, you mm -hmm. know? And that fucked me up. Like it was like really, really hard to be like. One of the hardest things uh, when Brad died was I was like, I thought I was gonna get to 
fix that. I mm. thought I thought there was more time to let him know that I love him and that I'm not mad. And there wasn't, you know, and like, and now I have to sort of do that thing where I'm like, it's okay. Like he knows, you know, and all that stuff. But I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. Like, does he, is he out there somewhere? Does he know? Yeah. Or did he die thinking that I hated him? You know, I routinely, maybe a year will go by, maybe, maybe a couple, usually no more than that. If it's somebody that really means something to me and we've just maybe organically or maybe through some miscommunication or maybe it was a breakup, like <laughs> full disclosure, most of my breakups, like 90% of them were the other person's fault. Like fuck them. Yeah. They should die. No, <laughs> a, I did used to, and I said this yesterday and so I won't belabor it, but like I did used to go like, Oh, they broke up with me because, because they were the problem. Mm -hmm. And it's taken a lot of time for me to, to just go like that's so inaccurate and i'm not seeing it from their point of view but i would you know i would love to repair with with people uh that and and i have that longing i want to do that i want to i want to like i was going to say maybe a year year and a half goes by and i will reach out even if it's really really tough a lot of the time it's not responded to and i don't get the satisfaction back but i have that thing in me that i have to try you know i've experienced that too i definitely have a few people who are like i'm good like we don't need to talk and i'm like okay and i you know and then you also have to like respect that too that's right you know because because it can't be a thing because what will eat at you is you're like i but i don't understand i don't get i don't and you because you're like well i'm not mad at you anymore like I, I, it, enough time has passed that like, I'm not, so why are you still mad? But that's also like, there's, there's stuff in this too, where like you and I each struggle with like needing to be liked as much mm -hmm. as we don't want to need to be liked. for sure. It's in there. For and sure. that's just stuff that like performers and artists have because yeah. we just want people to like <laughs> us. We just, you know, uh -huh. and so when someone out there who, especially a person who knew us well, and who spent intimate time with us is like, I actually am good if I never talk to you ever again. That's like, oh, that means that your experience of being that close with me mattered more. Right? Or or no, set you up to go like, I'm good. Oh, right, to, right. I'm good to never talk to that person ever again. And that means like, oh, oh, you know, it's so yeah. it's it's saying something about my internal brokenness when someone who is that close to me is like, I'm good. Like <sighs> You know, it's heavy. It's really, really heavy. But I, I do think if you can kind of pay attention to it and practice what you need to practice as far as like releasing, realizing there's things you can control, things you can't control, and just doing that over and over and over, the repetition of that will actually get like make you pretty, pretty strong. I think it, it, it should be said. I think before we go any further, the thing that we should say is that we had a couple skirmishes there was that big one and then for a year like we talked about last yesterday we were like not talking six months maybe right. longer. i don't know yeah mm -hmm. and it felt really weird and i missed you a lot and when we rekindled you were like we should do an episode on forgiveness yeah so this has been a long time coming and i i wasn't like scared about it but it feels very surreal to be here because um you know, I think this is what you do really well, Austin, is that on this show and and through, you know, your your content work is you're really fucking authentic. And so I thought this is the perfect place for two very like hard on your sleeve guys to say, hey, look, I didn't handle those situations really well. And I'm so glad that we're friends again, because for a guy like me who is a diehard romantic, I'm starting to figure out that actually, I mean, I, I'm i saying this because I'm in this present point in my life right now where I'm single, but I actually think friendships are maybe more valuable than a lot of romantic relationships. I don't know if they crest familiar but or familial, but... Um, but yeah, man, I'm, I mean, I know what you mean. I mean, I think it's, well, you know, it's different for different people because some people 
really do have that romantic relationship that's like the lifelong thing that's like that's their primary relationship in their life that Amazing. they're, they're going to be working you know and then there's and this is something that you and i have been getting used to and that that um lots of people live this way is like they they realize oh my life has been about chapters my life has been about different people at different times at least my romantic life my yeah. romantic life has been about chapters and my i mean my professional life has been about different cities and different eras yours has too and the things that have really stood the test of time for me are like my family and my friends period yeah like straight up fucking period yeah yeah man it's i i don't know like it's so weird to be 43 and feel that i am my best version like i'm not as well off financially that i'd like to be i'm not as like fancy dance but i'm so happy i have such clarity and i think the thing too that and i don't know if i'm jumping ahead tell me if i am i don't but uh, I, don't, I don't know where you are <laughs> <laughs> but uh you know i think the thing that when i think of forgiveness that has been the biggest lesson for me is that um you know and I know you 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 go through this as well. Forgiving myself. This is where I wanted to go next anyway. So we're right, <laughs> we're right on track. I thought so. Yeah. I wanted to get here anyway. Well, you you here, you you set you you set it up. I because we'll just well, but we're talking about it already. Like we're talking like like one of the things that makes moving on from romantic relationships hard and and accepting that someone else is like maybe upset at you is like you're you're not you haven't forgiven yourself yet for whatever it was that you did in that space and yeah. you need that other person to forgive you so like you're not capable of doing it on your own it's a codependent thing it's a thing of like like I, i'm i'll never be able to forgive myself until i hear from someone else that it's a, that it's really okay and i see from them mm. clearly that they really are okay but if i feel like they're still holding on to it then i'm like well I'm, then i'm i'm going to hold on to it Mm. And it is a problem with not being able to forgive yourself. I also was thinking last night as we wrapped up and decided to, to move on to today, like, I think that there's this thing and tell me if this, this vibes with you or not, or if you think that I'm full of shit where like people are on a spectrum where some people are really good at really good at forgiving themselves and struggle at forgiving others and other people are really good at forgiving others and struggle with forgiving themselves. Yeah, sure. Obviously there's going to be people who are good at both and bad at both, but I feel like that's a thing where like people who are really good at forgiving and because sometimes there's those people that like, they forgive themselves for anything and everything right away. <laughs> they never hold on to any, right. You know, like regret or shame or guilt for anything wrong that they do. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to when other people wrong them, they're like, mm -hmm. Oh, I will never mm -hmm. let this go. Mm -hmm. And you're like, eh, maybe, you should find the middle ground of those two a little bit more. And then there's, uh, you know, people like us who, um, I, I'm, I'm like so eager to forgive other people because I just don't like having that bad blood and that bad feeling. And so I'm, I'm so eager to get to the point where I'm no longer harboring that anger and that resentment because it just is too much to go through my life with. Um, and I can do that for other people all the time and I want to, and I always want to repair those relationships, but when it comes to me, mm. I'm just like, I'm hanging on to shit from when I was a little kid still, I'm still like, you shouldn't have done that, dude. I can't believe you did that. I'm still, I'm still not letting go of that. And that's the biggie. That is the crux of the whole thing is that when you can start to wake up and it sounds very cliche, it sounds very of the moment but like yourself a little bit more and be proud of your small and large victories. And that has been my saving grace in the last, I don't know, fucking 2017, six years, something like that, where I, I consciously made a decision to just unwire and untether myself from years of trauma, years of self-abuse, years of self-deprecation. Um, I'm not perfect at it, but I don't hang on to the things that I think were really holding me back anymore. And I feel, whoa. Ooh. Let it out. Baby. We knew it was going to happen at some <laughs> point, motherfucker. Uh, I feel very free, Austin. And I'm only 
you know, because we're talking about our friendship too. It's like, uh, you have to feel that safety, right? And I used to cry all the time. And I think that was just because I was in pain. And now I cry really at, at times when it just reverberates and when it's, um, when it feels impactful and it feels clear. And, you know, I love my life now, you know, and that I, you know, I haven't always <clears throat> thought that or said that, and it gets dark in here. It gets dark and my friends and my family and me are the ones I can always count on. That's right. That's that, that's that third element. It's... I love hanging out with me and not in a way where I want to tell other, everybody to fuck off and I want to cloister myself and get weird and, you know, be in a cave. Yeah, not, not but, isolating. No, I love finding out more about Wit mm -hmm. or Whitby, you know, that boy. Like, I want to know him. Sorry. No, it's really it's really beautiful, and I know exactly what you're talking about. And uh, and it like it's astounded me how how difficult this is for me. Like when people, I mean, geez, when I was first starting to get sober, and I I remember I went to a meeting where the theme was self love and like loving yourself, and it was an idea that I would. These people were talking about how they were going to teach me how to love myself, and in that meeting, I was like y'all don't know how much I did dislike myself. Like you guys, <laughs> good luck. Like it's not going to happen. <laughs> and I was like, at best, I'll just like be less mean to myself, mm. but I'm not, I'm, I'm too aware of all the shit that I've ever done to all the people that I've done it to and all the ways that I've been a selfish, uh, fuck up to just be like, I'm great. Like I, <laughs> I, I just can't, I can't, you know, but like, I, and I used to sort of be kind of like cynically comedic about it, but you and I had an experience together where we did some breath work where like I had this communion with my higher self where it was like this breakthrough moment of this. I was talking to this, you know, kind of more centered, true version yeah. of myself that was like, uh, Hey, I know that this is a really hard thing for you, yeah. but I love you. And I know that's really hard for you to, to hear and to say and it, it it set off this whole chain reaction of like where i started incorporating into my morning meditation and my practice regularly like consciously regularly telling myself thank you for showing up for this mm -hmm. thank you for showing up today for this meditation and also i love you mm -hmm. and just like getting used to saying that to myself i've fallen out of that this year and i really feel it i've mm. like fallen out of telling myself I, I love you and telling you know i still do my morning routine because i have to and i'm like oh, fuck it, I'm fine <laughs> and i stretch and i meditate you know and i like and i'm I'm trying and i go to therapy and i do my stuff but like i've fallen out of the habit of reminding myself that it's okay to love myself and i've noticed it i've noticed like mm. I, it, I it's a for people who struggle with self-love you have to practice it you have to yeah you know, because every day different experiences, different people, just the rigors of life are going to test that. They're going to test where your canteen, what your level is at, and how, how much preparation you have, how much intelligence do you have, how much of your soul are you in, in touch with. I mean, I'm, I'm now doing these new things in my career, which feels like the fifth or sixth iteration of a career air quotes and it's literally all about me n n being selfless and and teaching and directing and and running classes and there's nothing that i love more than these actors here in la that have been going to auditions or classes and being been on set and been in a rehearsal room and they come to one of my workshops and they they get to learn about themselves and they get to learn about peace and they get to learn about things that it's going to give them musculature to be an artist. And so all of these things are coalescing where like my internal work, my spiritual work, my artistry are all fusing. 
Mm -hmm. And that feels very special. And at 43, I feel young. I feel uh, like excited. I feel so, so sexy. <laughs> Last night you were showing me old photos. You were like, look, look, look at me. And it was like 10, you know, 10, 15 years old photos. You were like, look, look at me hanging out with this person or that person. And I was like, honestly, glow up, glow up. Awesome. You look cooler. Like this you look cooler now. I, and I've, I've told you this too. I feel like you're thriving right now. I feel like you're like genuinely living your best life and in, in your best self right now. And it's really cool to watch as your friend. Thank you, Austin. I mean, you, and I, I don't, you know, that moment we had in the aliens when you lifted me up after I struggled through that, Rehearsal process. I think we talked about that last time. Maybe not. Maybe. I don't know. That moment was dope as shit. Um, when we were doing Bad Person and you stopped me in Andy's fucking kitchen during a break and you were just like, I haven't seen you like this in a long time and I missed you doing this. You've always been great. Your audience should know. I want to tell you, even if these cameras weren't fucking on, the like for you to say i feel like you've glowed up you said this to me in salt lake city like you're so free with doing that you're cute dude you're fucking cute <laughs> and you know why you're cute is because you're smart buddy is because you're really smart and because you give a shit and you've taught me about free verbal unabashed love of people that matter and like if you don't do that if you don't stop your fucking life to check in and to make sure that people know that they're cared for. What are you doing? What are you doing? We're doing the anti Andrew Tate podcast. Yeah. Tonight. Fuck that guy. Yeah. Dude. This fuck is the, guy. this is the podcast where sensitive boys come <laughs> to, to be uh, open and vulnerable with each other and with the audience and tell each other that they, they love each other and that uh, it's okay to, to cry, and it's okay to... to <laughs> totally. Yeah. It's the most punk thing. Actually, it's the most punk thing. Yeah, it's the coolest fucking thing. Putting on aviators and telling women that they're like dogs or whatever? No, nah, man, you're done. You're over. <laughs> it's weird that you should say that, because... I was actually just about to. I just do have some hot takes that I want to. You have drop. some hot takes. I have some hot takes that I just want. Like it, like, <laughs> ladies, if you <laughs> keep going, please keep going. Ladies, if you're wondering why your boyfriend keeps crying while telling his friends that he loves them, <laughs> it's because testosterone levels are at an all time low, <laughs> and that's why. We need real men back oh. in the cover. Men that are afraid of women who think for themselves. It's so good. We <laughs> so good, dude. God, I'm an idiot. Uh, no, I'm glad that, that we're not like that. And it's one of my favorite Thank things God. about, about um, me and my pals and, uh, and the way that we are. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's contagious, you know? Like we have, we have mutual friends that maybe this wasn't their like their go-to mode right but hanging out with you or me or us collectively i'm leaving them nameless on purpose but they are now softer and say i love you at the end of phone calls and i actually think that that shit fucking matters i like how physically affectionate our friend uh jess is jess likes to kiss a lot and it's i love amazing. it i love i love it's when, amazing i love i love that I know every time Jess says goodbye to me, he's going to give me a big old hug and a big kiss on the cheek. Like, a yeah. bit, you know, and yeah. I love it. Feels great. Yeah. It feels great. And any of these goddamn, you know, stigmas and fears is all fear, man. It all goes back to fear. Yeah. It that's it. It absolutely does. I mean, fear is fear is the root of like, I mean, that, that's our first episode. Our first episode that we did together was all about fear, and we're we're bringing it back. Fear and forgiveness. Fear and forgiveness. Fear is the thing that keeps us out of being able to forgive others, and especially ourselves. Yeah. I think I have a lot of fear of, like, when I forgive myself, when I love myself, who am I? with? Like, for the longest time, I defined myself by the fact that I was, like, self-aware enough to know where my deficiencies lied and to know what, you know, 
that was important to me to not because I saw other people, the the kind of people who are on the other side of the spectrum who are yeah. really good at forgiving themselves but bad at forgiving others. I saw these people who it's like you don't seem to be you don't seem to carry at all the weight of damage that you do. You seem to just move right through it and move on with your life and have a self image that's like I'm the shit no matter what. I mean, I watched this this Dr. Phil clip the other day of like a <laughs> like a teenage girl who is literally saying that where she was like, I'm just better than other people. I'm better than everyone. She's like, so I don't I don't feel bad for other people. I'm better than them. Wow. And it was a thing where it's like that's a real thing that some people are walking around with. And I think that like it's it's not it's not healthy, but I don't think that my opposite side of the spectrum is any healthier where I'm giving everybody else space and grace and the benefit of the doubt. And I'm so fucking hard on myself. Like I just am like, no, I'm not deserving of that much. In both of those examples, I visually see that person wearing a huge winter coat and that blockage for whatever reason takes on this visual for me of this huge puffy coat and it just seems so heavy and it seems unnecessary and you know like as we're talking about all of this and i've been so ginger about stuff but it's like no man i forgive my bullies i forgive you mauricio buendia <laughs> i forgive you seth remus he's watching <laughs> i forgive you katie brandenburg and Haley royal and Morag Shepherd, and I forgive you. Yeah. Let's go get coffee if you wanna. Yeah. Because, like, my life's still going. I'm not getting any younger. And yeah, call them out. Get to the root of the shit. Stop dancing around. Be brave. Because what do you have to lose? What do you have to lose? Your coolness? Yeah. Coolness is, there is no monetary <laughs> level to coolness you know and the thing is that's funny is behind both extremes the person who says i'm better than everyone else and I, I don't feel bad you know and and the person who says i'm worse than everyone else behind both is fear yeah because this clip of this girl on dr phil i was like oh she's so insecure totally and so scared and the way that she's learned to combat her internal fear of moving through the world is she's created a self image. That's I'm impenetrable, Every, I'm, but sorry. It's, it's, but it's rooted in fear. Everybody that does something weird or shitty. This is going to sound so, so boxy. Forgive me. Um, they do that shitty thing or are afraid in what uh, they behave in a shitty way because of fear or pain. That's it. Yeah. That's legitimately it. We have an ex president who I would say all the time, I was like, there's a real missed opportunity that like Anderson Cooper, Jake Tapper should have literally sat Trump down and two questions. What do you love? And what makes you happy? And if they had asked that guy that, we would add a whole different story because you have to answer that truthfully. It's a truth serum. I don't know if anything's a truth serum with that guy. I think it's very. But you know what yeah, I mean. You yeah, know what I'm saying. Yeah. And so I feel like somebody that has insecurity and is angry. Um, some it, it comes from fear. It comes from pain. I just see them both as the same thing. Where it's like that person who's projecting, "I'm the best. I don't, you know, I don't owe anyone anything. I'm awesome." That's all fear. They have fear about the way that they're perceived by other people or or the things that could happen if they allow themselves to appear weak. Yeah. You know, so even Donald Trump, it's like it's all fear. It's like he's so afraid of being thought of as 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 anything other than like the coolest guy in the world. Well, you know people. why that is? Do you know why that is? Why? Because he doesn't have love, Austin. Yeah, I mean, his kids don't love him. His parents didn't love him. None of his wives loved him. He doesn't really have any homies, any like best friend chums like us. But I think that what I was going to say to finish the sorry, thought sorry. is it's the same process for a person because, yeah, maybe it is about love. Maybe it's about he's he doesn't have enough love. But I think it really is just like fear of not having enough love or fear of like because his response to that fear is, well, then I'm going to project this this image that I'm I'm the best. I'm better than ever, I'm the strongest. Yeah. You know, 
And my, my God, we're so burpy now because of our uh, non-alcoholic <laughs> beers. So burpy through this podcast. I have been at least. Uh, my response to it is I'm so afraid of being perceived by other people like for nothing other than my character defects and my mm. faults that I'm like, well, I'm going to get a head start on you and I'm going to be more aware of my faults than anyone else could possibly be. So that if I'm going to like, so anything you could say bad about me, I'll be like, Oh, don't worry. I've already said it. That's, but it's the same thing. Totally. It's, it's a defense mechanism against like being afraid of how I'm being perceived by other people. I'm not perfect at it, but what the universe did really, really great for me. How long do you think I've been short Austin? I mean, Forever. Yeah. I've been short the whole time. <laughs> and I realized like, that that is just a thing. And I've sometimes let it be a thing that would trigger other th stuff. But by and large, I don't think about it that much. I don't think about and it at all. You shouldn't. No. And it's like I've dated women that are 5'10", 5'11". I'll climb Machu Picchu. I don't give a shit. <laughs> well, the thing is, you make it your strength. Yeah. Whatever is your, whatever you feel is your defect or your liability. I mean, do I sound too Tony Robbins up in this? No, show? but you like you make no. it your strength. You have no choice but to make it your strength. But also, like I know, like easier said than like it's not. We live in a world that puts a lot of emphasis on shit that we shouldn't put emphasis on. People's weight, people's height, people's. Uh, totally. uh, like, like we put a lot of emphasis on shit that like we really shouldn't and we, we do it for ourselves and we do it for other people and it's not fair and it's not cool, but like, yeah, I think you do a great job at living in your body and, and being who you are. We do make a lot of judgments on people and I'm not going to get into the weeds on this one because it's boring, but there is an, there is, I forgot a name and I would like to thank, I would like to forgive uh natalie delgado all right yeah because i held on to a lot of pain and a lot of victimhood with that and her side of the story whatever that is we don't have to get into it is like i release it and i want that person to be happy and to thrive and in no way do i feel like i'm compromising myself by saying that in no way do i feel like when you when you do that with somebody that f you feel egregious shit has gone down, you, I've never felt the, the the physical effects of feeling like I'm bending over or 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 compromising myself. I feel the the opposite. I feel freedom. It's crazy. Hearing you do that and like say those names and be all bold, I'm like, that's a that's a cool moment on this episode is like saying like right here, I'm going, I want to just embrace it and go for it, balls out. I forgive these people. And it makes me, it's so interesting because I'm like, oh, who do I want to forgive? Yeah. Like, who do I and then I'm like, <laughs> well, what I would love to be able to do right here on the show is say I forgive myself. Good job. Finally. But I fucking can't with. I'm sitting <laughs> here talking to you about this, and I'm like, that thing is still really hard for me. And mm. it's so interesting to to know that to be here, sitting across from you, watching you do it, and be like, oh, I would like to forgive myself, but be like, I don't know that I can just do it by just saying it. I just like, I I I have such a difficult time with it. I, it, and it's something I want to continue working on. And I guess just for people out there listening or watching, like keep keep at it like you deserve it you deserve to let go of the grudges that you have for other people and you definitely deserve a life where you're not just living in a space where you're like constantly replant i mean i like i had a realization recently that that was pretty powerful and you talked about it a little bit you talked about like getting to know wit and being curious about who whitby is and what whitby likes and like i love to hear that name now no, put a pin in that. i i I, for so long, because I was ridiculed and people would call me wimpy, I had a motherfucker in grade school call me shit -bee. And then every other kid would say, and now I hear that and I think that's hilarious. But like my name, my name was used against me. Yeah. And it's probably within the last like 10, 15 years that that name now is strength to me. And it's, it's a town in England. It's a place I've been to. It it defines a lot of me, 
I love it. And when people, I've told you this before, when people start to get closer to me, mm -hmm. or it's the people I've known for a long time, but anybody that's newer, I get closer to, and I won't say this to them unless they fucking hear this, I guess. They'll start using that name. And I go, oh, this just got to like this crested into a, like a nice special place. Anyway. Yeah, no. I mean, I, God, I'm like hearing that. I'm like, yep, I have that same stuff. I have like people, people found ways to make, to use my name, to make mm -hmm. it about the thing that I was the most insecure about. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, like I, like girls that I was friends with mm. were relentless about my body because I was like so skinny and so bony that everything was like very, it protruded out. I had like a sternum bone that was very visible and wow. ribs that were very very knobby like elbows and knees and stuff and they would call me osteoporosis because it was like a bone disease and they would talk like and it's like the, uh, you know it's things that like kids they really find it they, it's so they, clever and they, terrible yeah they Oof. find a thing that you're like oh i didn't know that someone could a silly name could get at the root of like i have body images uh, image problems and I still do it like I, people on the internet are still being like, like now I went from being too skinny to being like, oh, now I'm like insecure about my weight. And people like are just know to be like, you're fat in the comment section. And I'm like, wow, how did you fucking know to say that? Like, how, did you, how did you know to say that? But do you know what you're doing, Austin? What? Is that you're doing exposure therapy by allowing yourself to be so public. We're so burpy. We're so burpy. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that, that like, you know, that's going to come. You know, that's part of the gig. You know, that like, for all of the great um, connections you make, you are absolutely throwing yourself to the wolves and you can't control them, can't control that they're writing that stuff to you because they're in pain and because they haven't rewired themselves to go like, that's not a cool thing to type. Yeah, I had a cool experience that I was going to talk about uh, recently that like, it was part of that realization, like in listening to you talk about being curious and curing that or healing that thing of like, I had a problem with my name because of what kids said is it, you know, and, and but like, that's, that's part of, I think, working with your inner child and like getting mm -hmm. back in touch with that. And I'd never really done any like inner child work, but this is something I think I want to start adding into my day-to-day -day meditation as part of my process of like getting closer to being able to fully forgive myself and love myself again. I talked about earlier how like I used to do the thing where I'd be like, I love you. Thanks for showing up mm -hmm. and telling myself I love myself, practicing that. I want to start reincorporating that into my process, but I want to incorporate this other visualization that I had the other day. I was at the dentist and I was starting, I was having a panic attack in the chair like I do because <laughs> that's just how I am. And I had this, I was talking to my therapist earlier this week I had a realization. I had told her earlier that like my panic attack started around the age of 19 or 20 and have gone since then. Cause that was my, the earliest time that I remember them being really a problem Severe. in, in yeah. my, pro in my life. And I had this realization. I can't remember when I think it might've been getting on the plane, going to Ireland or something that I was like, Oh, you know what? This is really a lot like, and I think it's actually the same thing is like, I always had a really hard time as a kid getting up the courage to go on like roller coasters and stuff. And it would, and there was a lot of shame associated with that because I was friends with other kids that would go on them. Kids that were my oh, age, kids yeah. that were younger. Yeah. And I, like every year we would have like, my dad's company would do a lagoon day. Lagoon's like a, a six flags theme park in Utah. And every year there would be like a company lagoon day. And every year I would, I would spend the year thinking about, Lagoon day is coming Ugh. and I have to like, this is, this is my year to go on the, the big roller coasters and not chicken out and not leave the line. But it was like a year of anticipatory fear. And there's also all this guilt and shame wrapped up in it where I'm like, how come other kids are brave and I'm not, how come I, and like the feeling of standing in line and like having sweaty palms and basically having a panic attack at the age of like six or seven and getting to the thing and then turning around and leaving. And then like the shame of being like, ah, fuck, I chickened out. I wish I hadn't chickened out, you know, but also, I mean, and so I realized like, oh, this has been with me for a long time. Mm -hmm. So while I'm at the dentist, long story coming That's to great. the point, I'm, I was sitting in the chair and this thought came to me where I was like, Think of the kid. Think, imagine your face, of what you looked like as a kid. Think of this kid terrified in the line for the 
the roller coaster and you know it's that same feeling that your insides are on fire and you're mm -hmm. freaking out mm -hmm. and and you're terrified and you just want someone to tell you it's okay you don't have to go on the ride you can get out of line or someone to like hold your hand and help you get on the ride you just need someone to help you and i just like envisioned that kid and then i imagined myself just like holding him as he's like screaming and squirming and freaking out me Whoa. in my adult body holding that kid and just being like it's okay and staying with him in the fear not not telling him shut up shut up shut up stop crying stop crying but letting just him just being there letting him do it letting him freak out letting him squirm and ah, and like lose his mind but holding him in it and just staying with him and that visualization like it brought me to tears i started crying which like made the people in the office uncomfortable they were like why are you crying and i was like well i'm having a panic attack but i'm also kind of having a really beautiful experience <laughs> with it <laughs> with it they're like cool open up uh -huh. but i started um but i thought that's an interesting exercise to do that i'm sure is i'm sure other people have been trying to uh, have been told by their therapist for years to do that exercise i've never heard that that's great but like really thinking of who what you looked like as a kid, as young wit, mm. when you're in those moments and being like, I'm going to imagine that kid, mm. you know, a lot of people know what that kid looks mm. like. A lot of people grew up with that kid. Um, and I'm going to hold that kid and I'm going to let him be upset. And I'm going to let him be upset about people calling me shit be and stuff like that and let him be angry and have that, that resentment. And I'm just going to hold him and just, and just be the, the adult version, the 43 year old version of me, the 40, the version of me that's like, <laughs> it's okay. We made it, bud it's okay. I'm going to just hold him. You know, I'm going to start trying to incorporate that. Fucking Austin. You are the one that said this, this is your fucking quote. You're the, you're the one that's, and you said it to me, you're like, your 15 year old self would be so stoked at who you were. And like, I did tell you that. Yeah. Hey man, sorry, sorry everybody. If you thought this was just gonna be a bunch of goofs offs and jokes, but this is the heavy one because like that's one of the be most beautiful things that anybody has ever said to me. And like I knew today was gonna be raw. I wanted to come here and just like let it rip because I think again it's most useful to use these moments and what you do really well with authenticity is to not be performative. And like, I'm not great at it. I have an earring in. I wear nail polish. I'm full of a lot of lies and facades. And do you think those things are lies and facades? I, I, I kind of think that you've been working really hard on finding <laughs> like what wits aesthetic is. My canvas, my canvas is true. Um, but you know, there are some elements that are very much like, I mean, if it's good for Harry Styles, it's good for me, right? So there is some sure. sort of like you. St I I literally used to think the same. I used to think that like seeing somebody else do something and then being like, I want to do that mm. was like, I was I'm I'm being inauthentic. But no, awesome. I'm not. I'm seeing and and I think what's inauthentic is to pretend like you didn't just see somebody else doing it and went, I want to do that too. Yeah, you know what? You I mean, you're we've talked about this a zillion times. It's the same sort of thing when people start shitting on things that are actually good just because they're like out of date or Wes Anderson and people are like, oh, he's too twee. And it's like, N but he's still one of the best. He's one of like the 10 best. And I'm sorry that like right now. The, the, the aesthetic that he has crafted and been true to, and he's like such a nice guy that sorry that that for some reason triggers your insecurity. Why are humans so weird about that? Yeah. It's so weird. He's I a master, mean. whether you like it or not. Yeah, sorry. And he's not stopping uh, according to how like disgruntled you are. But it's funny when people and all, like that in being inauthentic, people feel like they can catch you being inauthentic if they can point out where you got the thing from. Mm. So if they can point out, oh, well, Wes Anderson's just copying this director or that director. It's like, yeah, and he yeah. he would tell you that. Yeah. Like, so, I mean, I, I made, I made videos about it. I made skits about it, like about like when I started wearing a chain and mm -hmm. how it was like this whole existential thing where I was like, am I too late? Am I too late to the chain gang? And then I had to <laughs> remind myself like, no, it's totally okay to see something that someone else is wearing and go, oh, I like the way that that looks and go, I want to do it too. It's totally, it's totally you're okay. allowed to do that. It doesn't mean that you're fake. That's what everyone does. The it's only human, the only fake people are the people who are pretending like they just thought one day of wearing a chain and they've never seen it anywhere else. At some point, somebody was like eating and the other person was like, what is that? And he's like, it's a fork. 
And the yeah. other person was like, fuck my hands. I'm going to use a fork too. And then there was someone that was like, I want to use a fork, but will people think I'm just bandwagoning? On yeah. The fork yeah. That I'm just like, <laughs> I'm just cheesy. I like the fork. Yeah. So anyway, bottom line is uh, <laughs> the I, I think the point that we're getting to is like be nicer to yourself, um, and uh, and and I'm gonna work on that, and we're working on that. And <sighs> this and, was a wild one, dude. Yeah, Jesus Christ. Forgive other people. Uh, forgive yourself. You deserve it. Uh, don't really worry about whether or not they deserve it. That's 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 their journey. That's their work. Yeah. Um. Everybody's going through stuff. Uh we're sort of coming to a, 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 a nice landing zone here. You want to say um, the people you don't want to forgive? Yeah. Um, <laughs> just, <kidding. laughs> uh, just for balance. Yeah. Megan Gibson, who started the osteoporosis name. Fuck, fuck you. Her. Yeah. For real, fuck you. For real. Like, I hope your life's not going well. Uh, I was just trying to make a joke by putting pencil shavings in my teacher's tea. And Alicia Dan got <laughs> raised her hand and said, Wit did it. Fuck you, Alicia Dangot. You <laughs> fucked up my fourth grade. I made up the name Megan Gibson. It's not real, but I, you, but Alicia Dangot, that's a real name. Right? That's a real name. Yeah, that's a real name. <laughs> that's a real name. Uh, you talked earlier about um, you're doing courses now. You're teaching acting classes. Talk a little bit about it. Oh. Tell people if they want. If they're in the in the Southern California or Los Angeles area, and they're actors, and they want to work with Whit Herford on learning how to love themselves a little bit more and be in their bodies and and build the musculature of being a punk rock actor. How do they do that? So you can go to uh, any social media, Riot Act Theater, T-R-E, on Instagram. Uh, you can email me at Riot Act You mean T-R-E, theater. the spelling of theater, T-H-E-A-T-R-E, right? Correct, yeah. correct. Not like a movie theater. And uh, and you can Google me. You can go to um, riotacttheater at gmail.com and just email me. But basically what it is is I, you know, I started, I had a, have these ideas through the pandemic because I messed around with this when I was living in London where I wanted to teach, you know, just little thoughts I had. Not that I thought that I knew better. I had new philosophy as far as acting training, but I, I, I did feel like there was something I wanted to say. And it does circle around fear. It circles around the fear of not knowing who you are and internal work and so it's called the structure and it's a four tenant thing that kind of uses metaphors of biology um where you know it's uh it's blood type and lung capacity um skin graft and uh it's it's a way to kind of use those those metaphors to talk about what you have internally as an actor because during the pandemic you know self tapes and all that stuff started and uh, I started to see people be really desperate and really anxious about just needing to get a job. And so there was a lot of tension. And then there, it be, because you're recording, you can press stop, you can make it perfect. And perfect isn't in art. Like, th that's not a thing. And the more that people were embracing this idea of perfect or an expectation, I felt that their, um, not only their performances were growing more hollow, and even people would come into our rehearsals and I would be like, you're normally really great, but you feel very much in your penthouse and you're, this is now a cerebral endeavor rather than an artistic thing, which should be, you know, in your, in your gut and your heart. Yeah. And so that's what we teach. And, um, and I'm doing it kind of like sporadically, but pretty consistently and yeah, come hang out with us. Fantastic. And you should, I mean, for real. Uh, uh, and if you want to like know more about what Wit's doing, go to riotacttheater.org for real. Like just look at the photos, go look at like the, the photo galleries of old riot act productions and tell me that's not the coolest looking theater company you've ever seen. Tell me you don't want look at those photos and go, Oh shit, that's cool. And I want to somehow be a part of that or figure out what it is that they're doing. Go over to Wit's Instagram, uh, you know, just like Wit Hertford on Instagram and just like see, what what the dude is up to and uh there's good stuff there's good yeah. stuff there's some secret stuff that's happening right now but it's all it's a good time it's a good season and austin archer you're one of the best friends i've ever had thank you thank you thank you you're a lifesaver love you buddy i love you too yeah forgive you for everything <laughs> well <laughs> all, the, all the bullshit yeah man no yeah. i love you thanks for being I here. love you too yeah all right. Bye.
by see, see you later.